Hey folks, welcome back. In this video, we're gonna look at gravitational fields. So let's get started. To begin with, we're gonna look at gravitational field strength, and this is revision from National 5 and higher level. In that 5 and higher level, you saw that the gravitational field strength, given the symbol small g, is the gravitational force per unit mass, or the weight per unit mass, and that was its definition. The units, remember, are newtons per kilogram, n kg to the minus one, or n slash kg. And you should remember that g on Earth is 9.8 newtons per kilogram, but it takes different values on different planets. So here's the table that you don't get on the data sheet in the exam, but it's here for interest to show you the different values. Chances are, if you were asked to use one of these values in the exam, you would be given it, unless it was, say, the Earth or the Moon. And the Moon has a G value of 1.6. By a general rule of thumb, the more massive the planet, the larger the gravitational field strength on that planet's surface. So Jupiter, for example, has a G value of 23 newtons per kilogram, whereas Mars and Mercury have a G value of 3.7 newtons per kilogram. The main ones there that I would try and remember are 9.8 newtons per kilogram for the Earth, 3.7 newtons per kilogram for Mars, and 1.6 newtons per kilogram for the Moon, as these ones tend to be asked about quite a lot. Moving on, we're going to look at gravitational field patterns now. It says that you will already be familiar with drawing field lines for electric and magnetic fields. Gravitational field lines are drawn in much the same way. We say that a gravitational field is the region around a mass where another mass will experience a gravitational force. If we were talking about electric fields, it would be the region around a charge where another charge experiences an electrical force. And if we were talking about magnetic fields, it would be the region around a magnet where another magnet would experience a magnetic force. So we're wording this in the same way, but we're just saying now that it's a gravitational field and we're talking about masses exerting forces on each other. For a single point, mass, such as a planet, the field lines will take the following form. So they'll look something like this, where you've got the field lines coming in towards the planet. Now notice the similarity here to a negative single point charge, which would have the field lines in a circular radial pattern and they would be going in the way. So in this case, they're going in the way towards the mass, the planet in this case. And so the closer you get to the center of that planet, the larger the gravitational force, and the further away you get, i.e. the more spread out the field lines are, the smaller the gravitational force. So by a rule of thumb, the closer together the field lines, the stronger the force, and the further apart the field lines, the weaker the force. If we had two equal point masses, let's say two planets that had the same mass, then the field lines would be going in the way like this. And in this case, we've got the field lines at these points curving away from each other to create this gap or region in the middle where there are no field lines. And you'll see that away from the middle region, the field lines follow the same kind of circular radial field as we saw above, like that one there. However, for two non-equal point masses, i.e. the case where the two masses are not the same, such as the Earth and the Moon, it would look something like this. So there's my Earth. Earth, the bigger mass, and there's the Moon, the smaller mass, and the field lines look very similar to what we've just seen for two equal point masses. However, you'll notice the lack of symmetry in the middle this time. You've actually got more of a space over here towards the Earth than you do over nearer the Moon. And you've also got this point, which is a point of interest here. And it says to note that at a point between the two non-equal masses, the two gravitational fields will exert an equal and opposite force and cancel each other out. Notice that this point is not directly in the middle of the two masses. And this is because the two masses are not the same. So you'll see in this case, we've got the point actually closer to the smaller mass over here. And another way of thinking about this is that that point is like the center of mass of your system of the two objects. And so if we think about that in terms of this one for the two equal point masses, this space in the middle, directly in the middle, is where the two gravitational forces are equal and opposite and will therefore cancel out. Next, we're going to look at some consequences of gravitational fields. It says here that the gravitational field of the moon has a major influence on the Earth. Apart from the phases of the Moon affecting the behaviour of many animals, the Moon stabilises the axial tilt of the Earth. It basically stops it from wobbling. Without it, the axis would shift randomly and create major changes in the climate. So seasons wouldn't be the same and that could cause problems for the growing of food and crops and so on. The most observable phenomenon, however, is that of the tides. And we have two types of tides called neap tides and spring tides. It says here that neap tides have the smallest difference between low and high tide, while spring tides have the greatest difference between low and high tide. So this picture here shows the moon's position for the neap tides, so the moon would be above the earth here, and for the spring tides, the moon would be over here. Now due to gravitational forces, the moon is going to cause tidal bulges in the shape of the earth. So it says here that the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun creates bulges in the oceans with two corresponding reductions in the oceans in between. Gravity and inertia act in opposition on the Earth's oceans, creating tidal bulges on opposite sides of the planet, 
which is what you see in this picture here. So these are tidal bulges here. On the near side of the Earth, the side facing the Moon, so this one over here, the gravitational force of the Moon pulls the ocean's waters towards it, creating one bulge. On the far side of the Moon, however, over here, the inertia dominates, creating a second bulge. It goes on to say that the greatest influence on the tides is the Moon, even though the gravitational force from the Sun is much larger. This is because tides are caused by the difference in gravitational force across the Earth. The Earth's diameter is such a small proportion of the Sun to Earth distance compared to the Moon to Earth distance that the Moon exerts the greatest influence. Lastly, we're going to take a quick look at conservative fields and conservative forces to look at what they mean. Now, we say that the force of gravity is known as a conservative force because the work done by the force on a particle that moves through any round trip is zero, i.e. energy is conserved. And that is the definition for any conservative force. So, for example, if a ball is thrown vertically upwards, it will, if we assume air resistance to be negligible, return to the thrower's hand with the same kinetic energy that it had when it left the hand. And this is what we did during lots of conservation of energy problems at National 5 and higher level. An unusual consequence of this situation can be illustrated by considering the following path taken in moving mass m on a round trip from point A in the Earth's gravitational field. If we assume that the only force acting is the force of gravity, and that this acts vertically downwards, then work is done only when the mass is moving vertically, i.e. only vertical components of the displacement need to be considered, and there will therefore be no work done in the mass when it's moving horizontally. Thus, for the path shown below, the work done is zero. So if we look here, we're starting off with our mass m here at point A, we're going all the way up here, following the arrow, all the way around, all the way back to the start. So the overall energy required for this round trip is zero. And the reason is we're only considering work to be done here vertically, whereas the horizontal motion, we're assuming there is no work done. And because the mass has ended up back to where it started, then we must be able to say that the work done on it is zero, because its displacement is zero. The above scenario leads to an important result. The energy required to move mass between two points in a gravitational field is independent of the path taken. So that is what we mean by a conservative force here, that the energy needed to move the mass between any two points does not depend on the path taken, when within a gravitational field. And lastly, by this argument, a non-conservative force is one which causes the energy of the system to change. For example, friction causes a decrease in the kinetic energy. Air resistance or surface friction can become significant and friction is therefore labelled as a non-conservative force. So if we take into account friction in the form of air resistance or surface friction, for example, when we're doing questions, then that means we're dealing with non-conservative forces. However, you'll notice in questions throughout National 5, Higher and Advanced Higher Physics that often we just assume air resistance or friction to be negligible and therefore ignore it so that we can deal with only conservative forces and not non-conservative forces, as that's going to make things easier for us. That's all for this video folks, thanks for watching. If you made it to the end, I really appreciate it. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel and I'll see you in the next one. Take care.